Hey what's up everyone welcome to another video this is an H1B related immigration video and of course we have Rajiv back and Rajiv is an immigration lawyer we've done many videos with him in the past so check them out if you want to check it out i know that this video is super long so if you want to skip to any part of the video i will put the timestamps right in the description also you can speed it up if you want to to 1.5 or 2x so that way you get the entire video Here's my recommendation, no matter if you're a student, you're planning to come here or you're already on H1B visa, I highly, highly recommend you to watch this entire video because you never know when you will fall into one of this situation and I hope that you never fall into one of this immigration H1B or OPD situation and if you do fall under one of this situation, then you know exactly what steps, next steps you have to take. And now I will let you enjoy the video. Thank you Rajivji for doing this again, really means a lot to me and you're like a savior for our student community. Okay, so we're going to talk about four situations situations and maybe the solution is to all of them to is one but i'll go one by one and then you can say that yeah apply the same okay. sure. as first all right so the first one is uh, and this is all like uh real examples i'm gonna obviously not say their names but i'm just gonna say that this happened so what to do in, in this situation so a student who has a job, who got a job, he, his company filed for H-1B and maybe he's working for a startup or a smaller company and got H-1B picked up and approved but doesn't have a stamp. Now his company goes bankrupt and shuts down and they lay them off but the company is refusing to revoke the H-1B. What are some of the immigration options for that person. Let me take a step back, first of all, to explain what the government's thinking in this respect is and how they are wrong. You can file an H1, F1 to H1 in two ways, right? You can apply for a change of status. Yeah. That means I want my H1 right here. I don't want to go outside USA. Or you can file it as consular processing, which means give me my H1 approval, but I'll go to my home country for visa stamp. Mm -hmm. Both of them have their place. Yeah. Most cases we do F1 to H1, but there can be cases where we don't do change of status because there are th there's time remaining on their STEM OPT and they want to take another year and a half of that. So what we will then do is we'll, we'll file the H1 with consular processing option. That allows me to continue working on my F1 OPT and I can switch to H1 anytime my little heart desires. Yes. This is where government's thinking gets messed up. Mm. They say, unless you have received change of status mm -hmm. to H1, or you have gone outside if you've gone for the visa option, you've gone and gotten your visa stamp, you're still subject to the quota. Mm. They are wrong. I think if I took them to court, I have a better than 50-50 chance of winning. Mm. Because the language of the statute refers only to approval. It does not talk about these, these fine distinctions the government makes. And maybe the government realizes their own position as not being rock solid, they have not really applied that in any of the cases that we have filed. I know they say that, but they don't do that. Right. right. So theoretically, the fear is there that if you have not received change of status or not gotten your visa stamp, if you chose that option, you might still be subject to the quota. Mm. So that's one part. Now, what, I've what if I have received my H1 change of status and after October 1st, I lost my job? Right. Assuming that my H1 began on October yeah. 1st. No problem. I'm not subject to the quota. And when you say quota, what does quota mean? H1 quota. Okay. The H1 quota, you know, when you apply right. for an H1, you have to go through a lottery. Right. Why is there a lot? Because there's a quota. What is the quota? Yeah. Quota is more applicants, okay. less visas, right? Yeah. So one of the main goals we have is to get rid of the quota issue so that I don't have to worry about having to go through the lottery again. So mm -hmm. when students 
talk to you, they may have two issues to worry about. Am I still subject to the quota? And two, what do I do in the immediate future? These are two issues, <clears throat> two separate issues. One deals with what do I do today? And where am I going to be a year down the line? And the second question is the quota issue. Yeah. If I'm not subject to quota, anybody can hire me. Right. I can tell you this, that there are employers who need your skills so badly. I just got off a Zoom call with an employer in Boston who says to me, I don't care what it costs. Make sure my guy gets his paperwork. Yeah. Because the government has jerked him around so badly. Mm. So the point is that if you are not subject to the quota, finding a job may be a lot easier than if mm. you are subject to the quota. As to your immediate future, so this is the distant future. As to right. the immediate future, you have to worry about two things. Am I out of status? Am I accruing unlawful presence? These are two different issues. Okay. Anybody who is unlawfully present is always out of status. But anybody who's out of status may or may not be accruing unlawful presence. Okay. For example, if your F1 I-94 says duration is DS. When does the I-94 expire? DS duration of status that i-94 protects you if you are an f1 it protects you from ever 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 being unlawfully present okay. unlawful presence begins on the date either an immigration judge if you're being deported or in an application like an h1 or an extension or a change of status uscis tells you you're out of status 180 days begins to run from there what is the importance of unlawful presence? If somebody is unlawfully present for 180 days, they can't come back for three years without getting a waiver. And that waiver is 212D3 waiver. I won't get into that. So if you, even if you do get into a, um, an unlawful presence bar, don't be, don't be, don't give up. There might be other options. Okay. Mm. So 180 days, you're barred for three years. One year, you're out of status, unlawfully present, you're barred for 10 years. Okay. Mm. Or the 310 bar. So immediate future, we have to worry about two things. Are you out of status? Are you unlawfully present? If you're out of status, it's going to work out one of the two ways. You apply for a change of status or an extension or a change of employer anyway. And you convince the government that your out of status should be forgiven. Happened to one of our cases, they refused to, we took them to court, they gave it. Because there are situations where it is just unconscionable for them not to give you status within the United States. Otherwise, what is the end? It's not the end of the world, you can get a visa stamp and come back. But the problem these days is visas are so unreliable, you don't know when you can get it. So this is the context. Mm -hmm. we are, I'll summarize it. We have to worry about quota, we have to worry about status, we have to worry about unlawful presence. So in this context, all your questions will arise and be answered. So okay. in the first case, in the case that you mentioned, I got my H1 change of status, my company went bankrupt. I'm not subject to the quota. That part is taken care of. So any employer can apply for me. Yeah. Am I out of status? Maybe. Am I unlawfully present? No. Because my I-94 is still valid. Okay. Okay. But don't make these judgment calls yourself. Come to one of our uh, conference calls. We do one every other Thursday. Talk to me. Um, if you have the money, spend on my consultation. Or contact you. If it's one of your friends, I'll be happy to talk to you. Whatever I know, I'll be happy to share. Yeah. Uh, so don't make that judgment call yourself. Yes. But yes. know yes. that there's a distinction and you may not need to get sleepless nights. Mm. Okay. Right. So this guy, what I would do if I were him, I would find an employer as quickly as possible. I'm not unlawfully present, so I don't have to worry about my stay in the United States. I find an H1. 
transfer and chances are i've got a 60 day grace period and even if i go beyond that let us make a case for you or your lawyer make a case for you that these are circumstances beyond your control and they really are the company went bankrupt and you've got this virus knocking on your door people have trouble hiring yeah. people interviewing people so these are difficult circumstances government must be tolerant mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully after january once once we have an year in the white house uh, we not me but lots of people are doing that already our organizations are doing that i don't want to give you the impression that i have i have any power <laughs> here my yeah. my power is limited to knowledge of law and the courts so yeah. that's what we do and i think that's enough for most cases so that said your next step is find a job start an hr but so right so that person does have h1b and got approved after october of course and then the company laid them off uh, and they are the company is still not like the company is not that revoking that uh, doesn't matter. That okay doesn't matter. okay so so they that's fine they just have to find a new employer and that employer has to change uh, do the change of h1b yeah got it okay all right so now this i think this is very similar to the second case where the person has h1b uh, everything is approved change of status is done october has passed now the company goes bankrupt but they not bankrupt but the company goes through major loss and the company decides to do the wage uh, like a pay cut 50% pay cut so now they fall under the h1b wage limit what happens that like what is their option should they resign and find another job or should they stick with it and how do because now they are not any more like you know following the wage limit of h1b one of the problems with h1b and immigration in general employment based immigration you have intersection of so many different government agencies mm -hmm. and sometimes their rules can be different and compliance can be inconsistent mm -hmm. so <clears throat> uscs could have one rule department of labor could have another rule in general department of labor has said during the times of covid-19 if there is an across the board reduction in the entire company as long as your wages don't fall below the prevailing wages you're okay mm -hmm. normally what happens is prevailing wages 70000 employer is paying you 110 so as long as they bring you no 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 far below not less than 70000 you're okay because that was the prevailing wage even though you're making less money than stated on your h1b application okay. uscs has not talked about this but i don't think they'll be able to make much of a headway if they try to resist this so if you are not getting paid less than the prevailing wage given on your lca you're okay If you're getting paid less than that, start looking for another job. Mm, okay. So and then status could be immediately or just keep the job and just keep keep the job because you're out of status. Are you in violation of the law? You are there. You are working. I would argue, how am I breaking the law? If I'm not getting paid enough, how is that? I would like to get paid enough. Believe believe me, I would like to get that money, but. <laughs> all i can in my hands what is there i can report for duty and i am so yeah. as soon as i found out that maybe this is not a good idea i started looking for a job got it okay okay that that's awesome yeah perfect now uh third scenario this is this is where the h1b was filed uh it hasn't it was picked but it from the lottery but it hasn't been approved yet and the company shuts down and goes bankrupt that like you know the company say decides to like we are no more a company you know this company is then we are going to shut it down what happens because now the h1b is picked up and it's in this pending process state do company have to revoke the visa like yeah what are the options at that time so it's a little different than the first case yeah this 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 person has a problem in that they are not exempt from the quota even if the h1b is approved if the government finds out two years down the line that the company had already gone out of business on the date the h1 was approved they will take the position this h1 should never have been approved hmm. okay if on the other hand 
the H1 was approved, but the company went bankrupt the following day. He's okay. Right. So before approval, after approval, elimination of the job are two different circumstances. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Right. So he should assume that he is still subject to the quota and act accordingly. Okay. So should he pursue the company to revoke the visa? That's not his job. Why should he worry about it? The only reason he might want to do it is because when you file for a change of status, your service gets affected right away. Okay. So he should coordinate with his DSO. The DSO might say have the case withdrawn so that your service can be reinstated. They can do what is called a data fix. So they can reinstate your service so you can go back to school if you so desire. Mm, okay. Okay. It is not his responsibility to revoke, but it is it is his responsibility to make sure he's in status. So for status, he might want to coordinate, but as far as informing the government is concerned, that's not his job. But then what happens if he, uh, if this, the first H1B, the company which is shut down before the approval, is in the process and then he finds another job and they also file for H1. Well, they will file next year. So what happens? So how I does that work? Like, mm -hmm. That's a lawsuit. Why? Because government will take the position before we approve the case, the case is gone. No case, still quota. Hmm. The case yeah. is the job. The job is gone, the case is gone. I would argue, no. The case was approvable when filed. Let's change the scenario. While this case was pending, could I have filed an amendment or a transfer to another employer? I think I could have. So what is the difference between that and this? None. Mm. So when it was approvable when filed, I should be given my H1, even though the company went out of business and I filed a second. Got it. Okay, so final case now, this is not about H-1B, this is more of a OPT. And so the case is that the a student was working on OPT and the OPT was exp was expiring and they filed for extension of OPT uh, through STEM. So now they have another 24 months, but the OPT case hasn't been approved. It just says it's in uh, pending or processing state uh, on USCIS website and he's still working. And the expiration was, let's say, in April, and the status hasn't changed until like October or November. And in November, they find the USCIS decides that it's a denied, like the extension has denied. And this is the real case happened uh, with the student. So now what happens because he's been working, assuming that his OPD extension is going to get approved, and uh, from April to November, he's been working. But Obviously, in November, he gets a denial that his extension has been in denial. Well, first of all, the time that he worked is not considered to be unlawful employment because if you timely file an extension, there's a certain number of days you can continue working. I think it's 180. Yeah. You can continue working while the extension is pending. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if the extension gets denied, it does not retroactively put you out of status. There's no such problem. Okay? okay. You could still get your 60 days to depart. That's exactly the case I was talking to you before we started recording. That's exactly the case I had, I have with somebody else. So this gentleman, this young man, filed his paperwork timely for an extension. Turns out he filed the wrong version of the form. Mm. Government says he calls the government. Government says, Oh, it's no problem. Calls his DSO or office of the DSO, he's, they say, no problem, it'll be fine. He gets a denial. The employer tells me, whatever it costs, I want him to work here. Mm. So I said to him, I said, look, before I start spending your money, I'll be happy to sue the government. They have done 10 things wrong here. And I think we can make them see reason. But before I start spending your money, do this. Contact your congressman. Tell them that you are a local business. You are their constituent. You are a hardworking, good company who needs this 
talent and to step up and step in. The only thing wrong is the version of the form. He did everything by the book and he still had time to correct it. And they said, no, it's not a problem. Mm. So he's a victim of the wrong version of the form and of bad advice mm. given both by his DSO as well as USCIS. So they're going to do that. And I said, if they, if they are not going to fix it, then we will. Okay. So, but I don't want to spend your money until I know for sure that's what is needed. Right. Right. Now, what happens with cases where there is a denial? It's very difficult to overcome these denials. Government, see in law, there are two kinds of deadlines. Those that are movable, those that are immovable. Mm -hmm. USCIS takes the position that OPT deadlines are immovable. I want to test that in court one day, but hopefully not at your expense. Yeah. Right? With the expense of an employer who says, I'll fund the litigation, take care of it. Mm. So most cases like this, I tell people, listen, you guys, talk to your congressman, see if they can step, step in and maybe they can fix it for you. Mm. But if they cannot, I'm not sure you want to spend money on litigation. Mm. I'll tell you this. Yeah, if you are the son of Ganshamchi Das Birla or Jamshed Tata, yes, please go ahead, write a check. I'll fight for you. Right. I can't do it for you. I wish I could, <laughs> right? So, yeah. yeah, so that let's do that. Let's spend some money and see what happens. Mm. But if you are not, let's save your money and put it somewhere where it gives gives you better options. So think about um Keep applying for H1 from outside USA until you get it. Come back in. You know, find a job in a third country. I can't tell you how to live your life, but I can tell you what immigration-wise your options are, and they're not looking good. Mm. So a denial of an OPT for whatever reason could cause issues in trying to get that reinstated. Mm. Not impossible, but highly improbable. Again, thank you, Rajivji, for doing this. Uh, it's always a pleasure and super inspiring to talk to you. So thank it's you for your time. Be yeah. well, everyone. Take care. Keep those masks on.